Wow. I never thought that I would see scenes such as the one that you're seeing behind me here without it immediately being followed by a mushroom cloud. Tonight, you probably wouldn't know, but all of the airports west of Moscow were shut down temporarily as a result of a massive drone strike on numerous locations throughout Russia. We are truly approaching the denouement of this human tragedy, this geopolitical tragedy between East and West. And it's almost become impossible to keep pace with the news cycle. It is so transient, the information, it's so provisional that I, what I provide to you that I, I cannot possibly stay on top of things. So I might have to go to live feeds and I think you're going to know when the shit's getting ready to hit the fan is when even I'm doing live feeds. It's interesting, a commenter sent me an email and he talked about that compounding of information and the, the telescoping nature of information as we enter this quickening phase of events. Not to use biblical terminology, but that's the best way I can describe it. It's a quickening of events. More and more tragic information on a more rapid basis that's in greater intensity. And uh, he commented, he or she, I can't, I don't, I'm not sure who or what they were, but they made a very interesting observation that as we approach the end game, things will be happening so fast that the only way to, to effectively disseminate information is to do it in real time. Now, I've always shied away from that because I, I just the extemporaneous nature of having to uh, organize my thoughts in front of the world, I prefer to be prepared. I'm an analytical person, so I'd like to think about what I have to say before I say it. And uh, I don't see a whole lot of value in just me speculating on the fly. Some people do that very well, but there's going to become a point where it's going to be redundant for me to post uh, post hoc videos like this. So get ready, guys. I might have to start going live pretty soon here, the way things are going. Now, if you have no idea what's going on, like I said, all of the airports west of Moscow were temporarily closed. This is what you're seeing behind me is a region in Peskov where four uh, Russian military planes were destroyed. I think they were uh, cargo planes. So I think they're not necessarily military, but these are massive planes. They're Ilyushin planes, 70, Ilyushin uh, 76, I do believe planes. Four of them were apparently destroyed. Uh, simultaneous with that were attacks on Moscow and numerous other places throughout Western Russia. Okay. And uh, we have some unnerving conversations happening with Russian pundits and former generals. So this is Peskov. Now, the reason why this is so important is there are rumors, and I must say these are just rumors, that, and this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time, because I cannot fully comprehend how they're getting these beaver drones all the way. So they're originating from in Ukraine, we presume, unless they're originating in Russia, which wouldn't make a lot of sense because these are drones which are fairly uh, sizable drones. They'd be hard to smuggle in and keep under wraps in the country unless you were able to bring them in through forested regions of the Baltic states or even Belarus by some partisans. But Ukraine is down here, the Ukraine border. So these beaver drones that claim to have a range of up to 1,000 miles or kilometers, one of those. Big difference, of course. It doesn't really matter because Moscow is only 450 miles away. Okay, so or is it kilometers? I don't even know. I'll have to use my I think it's kilometers. To be honest, yeah, I think it's kilometers. So 450 kilometers, so they can easily target Moscow. But the idea that these drones are making their way all across Moscow, through uh, around the Belarusian border, in a region which I would presume at this point in time is heavily defended, seems almost implausible at this point that they're only being intercepted once they approach their target. What a lot of people are speculating is that, in fact, some of these drones might be originating in the Baltic states. Now, one has to wonder, is there some sort of special operation in order 
to bring NATO into this conflict. NATO is sweating right now. They are very concerned with BRICS and this resistance that you're seeing all around the world, be it in the Middle East, in Africa, of course, things are getting ready to pop off as well. The West is very concerned that if they can't stop Russia right now, that this is the end. This is the end of Western financial hegemony, and it's the end of the money printing era. It's the end of US and Euro uh, global reserve currency uh, domination. And for that reason, and with the elections looming in 2024, possibly even elections in Ukraine, it, you could almost make a case that there might be elements within the neoconservative complex that would like to really kickstart this war. And how do you do that? Well, you have to find a way to get NATO to invoke Article 5. Now, again, this is totally in the realm of speculation right now, okay? There is no evidence, as far as I can tell, physical evidence to support the idea that these drones came from Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania, for that matter, or the Baltic Sea. We have to presume that they came from Ukraine. And these are the drones that we're talking about. They're these beaver drones, okay? Now, 20 of these drones targeted Peskov, 20. So you're telling me that 20 drones made it all the way around here up to about 500, 600 kilometers to target Peskov without being detected? And simultaneously, they were attacking places in Bryansk and a, another place, I cannot recall the pronunciation, Oriol, Oriol, something like that. Um, and of course, these drone attacks are just happening on a daily basis. And a lot of people are saying that these pinprick attacks have no strategic benefit. But when you have Russia, who is already struggling with sanctions, their aviation sector is impacted by this. Okay, They're trying to build their own airplanes. They're trying to be as self-reliant as they can under the restrictions imposed by these sanctions. But all of these things have a little effect. It's, you know, people are too dismissive of a lot of these incidents. Maybe if it's one or two, but if this is something that's happening on a daily basis, I mean, just in the past couple weeks alone, we've now had hundreds of million dollars, if not approaching the billion dollar mark of just aircraft alone. Okay, these are very large aircraft, as you can see here. They are no joke. Okay, these are uh, very, you know, capable cargo planes that are used for a variety of purposes. They're very similar to the doomsday plane, in fact. And we've seen the Russian bombers targeted recently. We're seeing all kinds of critical infrastructure targeted. And it's like a, a mosquito. You know, it might not kill you, but it's going to drive you crazy. And it can cause you to do stupid, hasty things. If you're ever running through the bush and you're getting mauled by bugs, you're probably not thinking straight. It's probably not a good time to bust out your knife and start doing woodcraft if you're constantly having a swap because you're going to end up cutting yourself. Okay, and you could see the same thing happen in Russia where if they do feel as though uh, this pressure is becoming overwhelming and public opinion is starting to sink. And you're really starting to see in the videos now. And remember, they're about to make it illegal to film drone attacks, especially in and around the capital. That's how you know shit is getting real. Now, when they put up those air defense systems earlier in the year, I got to be honest, I didn't think that they would ever have to use those because I always presumed that if Moscow is being attacked, they're going to obviously make the connection that all the funding for Ukraine right now is coming through NATO. So whether directly or, or indirectly, NATO is the one who is technically at fault. Maybe not technically, but they are the ones who are funding these operations. They're providing the intelligence, they're providing the materiel, and they're providing the funding. And in some cases, they're probably even piloting them with their mercenaries. So one can only 
come to the conclusion then that ultimately <clears throat> Moscow is going to have to pin this on NATO. Now, they've been incredibly reserved and measured with their nuclear rhetoric, contrary to popular belief. There's been no explicit threats by the Russian government against NATO. No explicit threats. And we're talking about the top of the hop. We're talking about Vladimir Putin himself, although there have been numerous veiled threats and obvious subtext in his speeches that indicate that Russia will use its nuclear arsenal if pushed. Now, what has happened today is that a Russian general, in the usual rhetoric on Russian state-sponsored media, he is a former general, current sitting member of the state Duma. He talked about how Robotin, or some people call it Robotno, uh, you know, I'm not even going to begin to pretend I'm an expert on, <laughs> on uh, <clears throat> what do you call it, a Cyrillic and uh, Ukraine and Russia, and they have different ways of pronouncing things, and if you say the O or the I the wrong way, one side gets mad, so Robotino, we'll just go with that, okay? Uh, he's saying that it's an ideal place to use nuclear weapons because there are 30,000 troops there. The village of Robotino in the Zaporozhye region is an ideal place for the use of nuclear weapons. This is from War News 24-7. This stated was stated by the de deputy of the State Duma of the Russian Federation, General Andrei Gurulov, Gurulov, Gurulev. According to him, the armed forces of Ukraine have concentrated a large number of personnel and equipment on this part of the contact line, and this gives Russia the army the opportunity to destroy them all at once. Now, if they were to effectively utilize a escalate to de-escalate scenario by detonating a nuclear weapon in this region, if there ever was a potentially a region where it would actually tactically make sense in order for them to do so, it probably would be here. And the threat that everybody has got to keep in mind is that if you do believe the hype, the false hype, I, I'm thinking at this point anyways, or at least up until this point, it hasn't really, uh, it hasn't really been as the media has said in terms of Russia running out of weapons. If you believe the hype that Russia is running out of conventional weapons, then what other choice do you think they're going to have but to use their massive tactical nuclear arsenal? If they're sitting on 2,000 tactical nukes and but one could potentially bring an end to this thing, don't you think they're going to use it and they're going to justify it as saving lives just as the Americans did in World War II where they dropped the nuke on Japan? Although this, again... This was their post hoc reasoning. This uh, arguably wasn't what they were thinking at the time. But in hindsight, they could say, well, you know, we dropped a nuke and therefore we didn't have to go to conventional war with the Japanese, which would have cost us millions more lives. Do you think that the Russians might be looking at that possibility, especially with these attacks that are becoming more numerous and are increasing in their intensity? And because we don't know exactly what the figures are in terms of the failed offensive and how it's going, we must presume that Russia is still, especially considering the frequent attacks on their soil, considering utilizing the nuclear option. It's baffling to me that uh, it seems as the longer this war goes on, it almost seems like the more careless the media becomes in its reporting of the nuclear threat. It almost seems like it's working in the opposite direction. When the reality is, is that you are gonna hear more vociferous calls for the use of nuclear weapons in these more extreme um, chambers of the Duma and with Russian media pundits, obviously we've heard this from day one, but we're approaching a level of brinkmanship never before seen. And I hate when people bring up the Cold War because the Cold War was supposedly when there was a standoff in Cuba. That was the closest we've ever been to nuclear war. But people need to remember that at that time, there weren't that many nuclear weapons. In fact, you know, at least at that time, uh, the, the actual result of an all-out nuclear war would have been very survivable, and uh, it, it almost would have been better if it was fought then, believe it or not, because then maybe we would have uh, a clear understanding of why nuclear weapons either should be abolished 
or there should have been more aggressive treaties put into place. And I think you only get there until you reach that, that climax of events. And I, it appears as though that we're reaching that. Now, there was a, a video that was released. Let me see if I have it here somewhere. So this is the actual video where the general is discussing this. And I'll just kind of narrate because it's in Russian. He basically says what I just said, but I'll narrate it anyways. It's perfect. They're all gathered there in one pile. Just perfect. Now, you know, understand that Robotino is a, a large place, but sure, with a few tactical nukes, you could probably cover a lot of ground that you couldn't cover with conventional weapons. And for a lot less money, considering that tactical nukes have already paid for themselves and they only really do... You only re ever really get to cash them in when you use them. That sounds crazy to say, but it's true. Then it's just a perfect scenario because in this situation, there's a complete absence of enemy reserves. And even with the existing forces there, it would be enough to go forward and nicely liberate the Zaporozhye and maybe even the Dnipropetrovsk and create a full threat to that group that fights around Donetsk in circle and fully destroy it. And if you take it together with Kupiansk, it's their end. So he's saying that there's a possibility that Ukraine could, in fact, be successful in this Zaporozhye campaign unless they utilize this option. This saves the lives of our fighters and solves all the problems, 100%. And when people scream about some Armageddon, this is all a little dramatic. They say everything will be contaminated. Everyone will die there. No, nothing like that. It's a simple aerial nuclear explosion. The destruction zone, the devastating effects of nuclear weapons are extremely clear. It's extremely clear where it will go, and it's extremely clear how to go around them to save our troops. That's it on this. We have competent and smart specialists. It is our military science. Everything is written out. Okay? So, while it's true that a, a limited, a single tactical nuclear detonation is only going to have a limited impact on the surrounding region temporarily, especially if it's an air burst and not a ground burst. It's not going to lead to prolonged uh, fallout and contamination. There'll be fallout, but there won't be a permanent contamination. So they're already starting to really soften to the idea. And I don't think I've ever heard it discussed, certainly not by a sitting member of the Duma, or a former general in such detail as to why it would actually be tactically useful at this point in time. Typically the argument is that it's not going to be useful to use them. So why would you use them? The only reason why you would use it is in a demonstrative way. So to perhaps uh, force negotiations, show them that you're serious. But in the way he's talking about it, he's actually talking about utilizing it tactically for the purpose of uh, saving the lives of their reserves and not having to throw them in the meat grinder. So uh, it's an interesting theory and uh, I guess we'll see how it plays out but I, I cannot for the life of me see where we're going to be in three months time. The pace of escalation at this point is increasing. It's only getting faster and faster. Pretty much every day now, since uh, every day of August, there's been drone attacks inside Russia. Most of them very, very close, if not inside Moscow. To me, that's just a, a staggering statistic. And you'll never hear about that in the mainstream. And that's why this is so incredibly dangerous. So incredibly dangerous. And now that there's these rumors, and that's all they are, about Estonia and Latvia, who pretty much are sitting ducks. You know, it would not be hard for the Russians to just roll over and take those countries relatively quickly. NATO has forces there in the thousands, but not nearly enough if the Russians wanted to muster forces in that direction and take it over. I mean, it would be... I, I'm not going to say it's going to be a three-day job because we all know what happens when uh, people presume that's going to be the case, as was the case with Kiev. But, you know, they have Belarus and they, they do have access to the Black Sea, but 
would that ever get to that point? The concern has always been, will America and NATO actually come to Estonia and Latvia's defense? Would they be willing to sacrifice billions of lives? Would they be willing to sacrifice really the meat and potatoes of NATO, the big Western countries who uh, comprise the, the, the lion's share of the gross domestic product? Would they be willing to sacrifice uh, all of that just for the sake of protecting these countries with relatively small populations? Countries who have already given most of their military equipment to Ukraine to use. They've basically given everything they have for the most part. Almost, almost as if they know that if Ukraine is unsuccessful, they're just going to be steamrolled and they're going to be reintegrated into some new Soviet-style bloc, CSTO or whatever. Um, Collective Security Treaty Organization, as it's called, Russia's NATO, if you will. The war is just getting crazy and crazy, crazier and crazier by the day, because we know Germany is now going to be giving another 100 tanks to Ukraine. And Ukraine claims, and this is where the Russia bros need to reassess the situation. Ukraine claims they've only lost five of its 71 Leopard tanks. Now, I don't know how true this is. Obviously, this is from Forbes. It's Western media. But how do you know that the Western media isn't just going along with this narrative that Ukraine is getting its ass kicked in the counteroffensive, which it appears it is on almost every front. You look at the videos. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence to support that. But what if it's not as true? Or what if the, the uh, discrepancy is not as big as a lot of people claim? What if the Ukrainians are actually doing a lot better and this Robotine offensive is actually ultimately going to be more successful than people think while concurrently attacking targets within Russia on a daily basis? Well, this potential use of a tactical nuclear weapon would seem more appealing. The Russians have everything they need in place to do this at a moment's notice. In fact, they're talking about they're talking about utilizing artillery, nuclear artillery, very similar to the Davy Crockett style weapons that were floated by the Americans. And I think, I uh, don't think we actually have those anymore. I think they've been decommissioned, but they're small, one kiloton, well, small, still very large, but I think they're up to one kiloton or something like that, very small nuclear weapons. And if we start seeing the normalization of that, you know, that's when we're in a whole different realm. To me, the normalization of the use of, of nuclear weapons in any capacity is almost on par with aliens. They, I mean, for people to get acclimated to the notion that aliens exist is very is on par with the use of nuclear weapons. Like, it just seems unfathomable to me that that people would um, be able to, to wrap their heads around that, but we will. And that's, that's the scary part, is that it's so incremental that when it does come around, there's going to be a big shocker, and then, you know, there's going to be a rush on the stores, panic buying, markets collapse, yada, yada, yada. A few weeks are going to go, go by, and there's not going to be a big NATO response, and everybody's maybe going to calm down. This is the concern. And then maybe it happens again right? And this is, maybe the escalation is not going to be as rapid as people think. But if there is truth to it, and we do find in the coming days and weeks ahead that there is some complicity with respect to what's going on in Estonia and Latvia, and how could there not be, when they have U.S. warplanes utilizing their airspace to do recon and surveillance, and God knows what else, what other sort of uh, military installations that could potentially be used to assist these types of operations that will accumulate and will have a impact on Russia's capability to fight the conflict. Again, these pinprick attacks in and of themselves are insufficient at derailing the Russian war machine, obviously. 
but they start adding up after a while, even just mentally wearing on the population. So just watch out for this because this is serious. And I think there's a reason why Russia is now talking about nuclear weapons. They're talking about nuclear weapons in the sense that they are charging the United States with not ratifying a treaty for closing nuclear testing. Apparently, there's been several NATO states that have signed on to this treaty, but the U.S. is the only country to use nuclear weapons and the leader in a number of nuclear tests keeps the issue of resuming tests open and refrains from ratifying the nuclear arms treaty. It's very important because we've been so indoctrinated. Most people do not know the depths of their indoctrination. And it's very easy to just presume that we have it good here and we have it better than every other place in the world and we are the best. And it's good to be nationalistic, it's good to be patriotic to an extent, but how do you know you're not delusional? How do you know we're not the bad guys? <laughs> you, know, you look at what's going on in Niger where the French are just refusing to leave even though the, the newly, I guess it's not really an officially recognized government, but the newly formed uh, government as a result of a coup, whether you like it or not, has the support of the people there. Um, they want them out and the French are saying we won't leave. When you look at the history of Pax American imperialism and neocolonialism even in Africa and other places around the world, it really starts to look, it doesn't, it's not a huge stretch to say, hey, right now, anyways, uh, we're probably the bad guys. We probably look like the bad guys to a good chunk of the world, which is not to say that China and uh, any sort of authoritarian regimes are going to be a better substitute, not by a long shot. Trust me, t the way that TikTok censors things nowadays, if that's an indication of where China is going to take us, then I want no part in it, <laughs> okay? Because you can't even, uh, the only things you can post on TikTok, as long as it keeps people fighting with one another and keeps people distracted, but try to post a, a video even just barely showing a gun for a split second, banned, deleted, you know, deranked, delisted. Anyways, um, what I'm trying to say is that there's a possibility here that it's us who is getting ready to fight a nuclear war. Something, it's a possibility that people need to consider that Mad Vlad may not be the only ones with nuclear ambitions. So, something to just keep in mind. Are, is it that our fundamental beliefs about Western society are, are flawed and that we, in fact, are the aggressors nine times out of ten? I don't know. Just saying it's something to think about. Ukrainian drone and tax, attacks inside Russia use Western intelligence. This is from antiwar.com. The U.S. expects Ukrainian drone attacks in Russia to increase even more. To increase even more than what we've seen already? Do you really imagine a world where attacks in Russia become that frequent? That there is no repercussions for NATO when they're using... Western intelligence, Russia will be faced with a decision to have to attack NATO in order to halt these attacks or potentially face defeat. And uh, that, that day is coming. U.S. warns Russia about questioning diplomats. So we're starting to see diplomatic tension ratchet up. And of course, Medvedev his usual apocalyptic uh, concerns. So things are, are just uh, escalating in the wrong direction. I guess escalate, the definition of escalate is always bad. So <sighs> this is my one, the one thing that makes me a little hopeful. Lindsey Graham and Zelensky are starting to talk about the prospect of elections if the West funds these elections. Now, one could 
look at the situation in with the drones in Russia as being a decoy for a failing counteroffensive. That's one of the narratives. And the fact that the Ukrainian military is possibly on the brink of collapse. This is but one narrative. I'm not saying it's true. Now, if you wanted to pass the buck, if you wanted to transition and get yourself out of this situation, the best, simplest solution is just to put another face on it. And that's probably what they're going to do with Biden. Okay, they're probably going to get him out of there somehow. They're going to have another candidate take his, and this is going to be very effective because everything Biden did then, it's not going to be that person's fault. People will say Democrats, Democrats, but at the end of the day, it's a great way to transition into a new phase of the war. In Ukraine's case, I can only see them holding elections if the situation was so bad that Zelensky needed to get out of town and uh, go and reside in one of his villas in a far away place. So I do have hope, in fact, for the prevention of the escalation of this conflict and that these drone attacks are just a way of saving face, a PR win. You know, Robotine is <laughs> appears to be the victory that they need in order to rally people. They've made attempts to cross the Dnieper River. They've sent in special operations forces into Crimea. As of recent, they're really trying. They're really doing all of these pinprick attacks, which are adding up. Death by a thousand paper cuts is a great way to explain exactly what is going on. Now, I want to give you guys a heads up. The company Jace Medical that we've been working with for a couple years to get people prepared with prescription antibiotics that a doctor will prescribe you. Antibiotics are one of the most important things for your medical kit to step it up to a very advanced level. Uh, they also, of course, have opened up the floodgates for more types of chronic medication that people need so you can buy years supply. They also recently added ivermectin to their offerings. So you can go and get that. That just went live today. So you can actually pick some up. We're not saying that it can be used for any particular ailment. We're just saying that this is a drug that has been administered for a variety of different use cases around the world for many years. Uh, what is it? The whole thing, a billion doses or something like that. So it has a variety of different uses and you can go and pick some up through the link in the description at jacemedical.com. It helps support this channel. If you go through those links, they are affiliate links, full disclosure there. And yeah, just get it while the getting is good because all that stuff comes from India and China. And speaking of India, we spoke recently about how they're restricting rice. And my thinking is this is partly due to the climate issue, but I also think it's due to uncertainty over a lot of the stuff that we're seeing right now in the world. Geopolitical stuff, the potential for World War III, let's just say it. So now they're imposing restrictions on almost every type of grain. So not only have they restricted all non-Basmati rice exports, this is 25% of the global rice supply taken off the market. That in itself is going to create a huge spike in prices when it's finally realized in the system. And when demand catches up to the lack of supply, that's when prices are going to rise even further. And of course, this is going to cause a lot of problems in the developing world as a result of Ukraine's grain corridor basically being shut down. And whatever grain Ukraine is able to ship out now, it's likely going to go, it's always went to Europe anyways. Europe will say, well, that brings the price down overall. But now they're going to have to do it by train or by truck. And that's going to cost more money. And, you know, so it's going to raise the price of everything and... Now they're even going to tax basmati variants. They're going to tax parboiled variants. And I believe they're even going to be taxing the uh, unhatched or uh, un the, the, when the husk is still on it, they're going to be taxing that as well. So we're likely going to see the price of rice skyrocket. And you see the price of rice skyrocket, that's when you know shit is getting bad all over. And the more austere conditions get, the more unsettled domestic populations become and the more extreme governments need to be in their decision making 
and the greater the potential for war escalation. So it's like a positive uh, self-reinforcing feedback loop where, you know, the people get poor, the rice gets more expensive, the people get more agitated, they start demanding the government do, do more, and typically that is going to mean uh, either, in Russia's case, Russia has a lot of food, mind you, <clears throat> still the price of rice increasing in other places around the world increases the demand for those commodities everywhere. So they might be pressured into making, doing more rash decisions, doing more extreme, uh, using more extreme strategic approaches to trying to bring this conflict to a rapid conclusion. Interestingly, I just read an article. Now I don't have it here, but let's just um, let's go to what should we do? PressTV.com. What does PressTV.com say? This website has been seized. Press TV is basically the main state-sponsored media agency of Iran. Okay, we all know what's going on in the Persian Gulf. You got Marines there now. You got, I think there's even an aircraft carrier there, if I'm not mistaken, or there's several warships. And uh, there's just a lot of back and forth seizing of uh, cargo vessels, oil vessels, and shit's getting ready to pop off there between Israel and the United States and Iran and that whole uh, triad. So the domain PressTV.com has been seized by the United States government in accordance with a seizure warrant issued pursuant to 18 USC blah blah blah. So the FBI has seized Iran's website. That's a sign that things are getting real bad. Okay? This is that's that's big because this is their main news source. Iran is a country of 80 million people. They have a very substantial GDP. They would be in the G20 if they weren't the most sanctioned country on earth next to North Korea. So, you know, the tables are turning everywhere. You have Saudi Arabia about to cut a deal with China to build nuclear reactors. Saudi Arabia has basically chosen whose side they're on. They're the ones who are that the petrodollar is pegged to, so if that goes, everything starts to go. Russia has continuously been intercepting drones in the Black Sea. What else is new? It's only a matter of time before one gets shot down, I would say. Um, in terms of the fire situation, it's biblical. That's the only word I can describe it. It's biblical right now. What you're seeing here is, this is all smoke. Okay, this is all smoke and there's no cloud cover right now in and around the regions where it is with the exception of some on the west coast here in and around the regions where it's most at risk of fire this smoke has been so thick you can see it's going all the way down to chicago down the jet stream it is insane and the reason why it's so bad right now is because in the last couple days there has just been this heat dome right over, smack dab over top of the place that is most prone to fires at this point in time. Some of these temperatures are between 15 to 20 degrees above what is normal, okay? It's 34 degrees here today, and, you know, I mean, that's above average for around here. It's not crazy, crazy, but it is still well above average, but, uh, you know, and this heat dome is going to continue. It's going to start to move down to here. And then so you're going to get some pretty high temperatures down here. Eventually, we'll get a little bit of relief, but not much. It's still going to be above average. So you're going to see the fires just continue to rage. Obviously, I would be remiss to not talk about what's going on in Florida right now. It appears as though it is currently a category to hurricane let's just let this animation load here so we can see the exact trajectory of things move it over there so my big head ain't in the way hurricanes are nothing new so it's just one more thing that we're gonna have to deal with it will not go away so here's the animation so you can see it's ready to make landfall as we speak. Likely tonight, let's hope that it's 
makes landfall quickly and it doesn't do what Katrina did and hover in and around there off the coast, causing the levees to break and all that jazz. I know nothing about hurricanes, but I know that Florida is probably not a good place to be when the shit hits the fan for this reason. Imagine uh, without early warning detection systems for these weather events, without weather radar satellite, you know, you'd be on your own. If there was ever a grid down situation, you'd be at the whim of people with their ham radios and these things would just happen. And uh, you would be stranded when there was no helicopters to pick you up. So to me, Florida is just not a good place to be when it all goes down. Uh, you want to move inland for the most part, away from dense population centers. Unfortunately, you know, from Miami to Orlando to Tampa, all those places are overpopulated. Great place to live while the grid is up. Fabulous place. I hear Miami's a very fun place if you can avoid catching STDs, that is. But, you know, guys, I think we're at a point now where you really have to consider where you're at and uh, make sure you, at, in the very least, have an escape plan and a bug out location. What else do we need to talk about today? I wanted to comment on this. I'm not trying to throw shade on other YouTube channels, but this is the problem, okay? These are the channels that, gets, that get pumped by the algorithm. We don't get pumped by the algorithm and you know, for some, I, I'm actually grateful for that because it, it minimizes the attention that is drawn towards me. I feel as if I was on this level, then there are certain things that I simply could not say. So I'm actually glad we haven't transcended this last level into becoming an A plus YouTuber like real life lore. But this is a great example of how these people get away with misleading people about the current state of things and why they're disingenuous, they're dishonest. They know exactly what we do. They're smart enough. Anybody with a channel that big knows what's going on. Okay, you're smart enough to know what's going on. You just simply choose not to because it's not financially lucrative to do so. How war in Ukraine is destroying Russia. 6.2 million views nine months ago. I, we've never gotten 6.2 million views on a video. Actually, I think we, we're getting close with our toilet paper tablet video or our piecrete video that we did. It's a short, I think it has 17 million views. That's our most viewed video. You know what I've noticed? And perhaps I'm just becoming a little too cynical here, but the, the videos that do best for our channel are the dumbest ones. Like they're the dumbest possible videos or things that we've ever embarked upon that's what gets the most attention. I'm not sure if that's by design or, you know, I'm not even gonna say that. It isn't, it's just, that's what the demand is for, okay? So it's almost like the more erudite rants we do where I'm actually maybe providing information uh, with substance, it seems like those never get the traction. Even some of the very, very high production stuff that we do just never gets the attention. Our celebrity survival score videos, that are getting you know really good watch through times like 95 percent watch through times on almost all of those shorts and the algorithm just is ignoring them altogether so you know i mean it might just be an algorithmic glitch but it's interesting what what videos get picked up and which ones uh, the buttons get pushed for anyways three days ago why russia isn't actually collapsing oh okay and he lays out all the reasons in his video that I provided in the video I did last summer comparing the United States economy to Russia, where we talked about their military capability, where we talked about their abundance of resources and their oil reserves and their coal reserves. And we went over all this stuff. They basically just did that same video. I'm not saying they stole the ideas. But all of that information was out there at the time, but they ran with this instead because that's what was trendable at the time. So it is what it is. And uh, now we have uh, this, they, them. Sarah Ashton Cirillo 
in Ukraine, free speech matters. It is great interest. It is a great interest that I look forward to Tucker Carlson and Vladimir Putin engaging in an open public discussion. Sarah Ashton Cirillo is the head of the Ukrainian SBU public relations team or whatever. So, uh, okay. And uh, anyways, this is the another comment I found on her Twitter. She says, question the AFU block. So yeah, if you question them at all, they're going to block you. But of course, they are for free speech. And now I was very <sighs> suspicious as to why they were encouraging this whole thing with Tucker Carlson and Vladimir Putin. And I still don't know what to think about Tucker Carlson entirely. I think it's, I don't know. Some of these things seem a little too convenient that some people get to do what they do and live to tell the tale, so to speak. Even Elon Musk is the savior and anybody who they say is the savior, I'm always um, suspicious of, which is not to say there aren't bona fide uh, people birthed from grassroots who can rise to the occasion and um, help us overthrow the, the tyranny that currently reigns supreme. But I'm always skeptical of that and I'm never jumping on any bandwagons or joining any personality cults, that's for sure. Ah, where else should we go here? I guess we're going to see this massive emergency alert test. So hopefully nothing happens until after October 4th when they do the massive emergency alert test because, uh, you know, everybody needs to get a taste of it first. Americans are increasingly single and okay with it. I'm starting to think that part of the reason why the housing prices are going through the roof year after year is that you just have less people living together and you know there's there used to be nuclear families you used to have families where the grandparents lived and now they're trying to separate everybody so a part of the reason why housing is becoming so unaffordable is because you're dividing people and you're having more and more people living single solitary lives but it's okay because soon there'll be Plenty of pods for everybody. I should start doing pod videos on YouTube. That will get a lot of views. You know the videos where you go and stay in the Japanese pod hotels and you get your little pod and your virtual reality headset and shared bathroom? That's the future, guys. A lot of people are talking about bricks and de-dollarization. An important thing to consider is that before de-dollarization happens... I think you are going to see the collapse of the euro because they're going to be the economies most impacted by not getting cheap Russian gas. Europe is dependent on cheap Russian gas. They're finding a ways around it right now. They've benefited from having the weather uh, at their favor for the last couple of years, but you know, eventually it's going to catch up with them. And this big chunk of the global reserve currencies currently in circulation is the euro. So it's very likely that the USD will Pac-Man into this before it eventually is overtaken by whatever BRICS nations start to trade in their own currencies. And I'm not even going to begin to start to analyze the global economic situation. This video is long enough, but we are going to be having a special guest on the channel in the next couple weeks. Who's going to break it all down and provide some new perspective. We haven't interviewed this person before and uh, they tend to be a little bit more edgy. So I think some people in my audience will enjoy that edgy with uh, various libertarian style talking points. We all know that the central bank is buying more gold. We know that there is this very uh, uh, strange deviation from 10 year U.S. Treasury yields and gold price that has happened just this year, which is kind of scary and open to interpretation. As you can see there, this is something which is mostly correlated up until this point in July 2022, and then everything just changed, okay? So right now the market is rallying. I think it's just, I don't know what it is at this point. We all know it's overvalued. We all know it's gonna crash. Better to get to be a second too early than uh, what does they say? Better to be 10 years too early than a second too late. So I'd say, you know, if you can, get out while you can. Russian propaganda ad that I'm not even going to bother showing you. We got a lot of uh, video footage coming out about 
the attacks on Moscow and whatnot. North Korea wants wants to put uh, nuclear weapons on their warships. We got uh, Japan calling for U.S. nuclear weapons. That's a weird statement. You could have never thought of that in 1946, could you? And uh, we got the cyber attacks ramping up on both Polish websites, on Polish railway system, as well as UK airport. So what we would see in the run-up to the bombs dropping is hybrid warfare, cyber warfare, and uh, all those types of things. My friends, I got to go. If you want to get some of that stuff that I talked about earlier, go through Jace Medical in the comment section before. Gear up while you can. Inflation is only going to get worse. Get your guns, get your gear, get your gold, and all that good stuff, and your medication at Jace Medical. Thanks for watching, guys. Stay safe. Canadian Prepper out.